Now, learning how to build web apps is great, but there's so many other things to do with programming. In this video, I want to share some of the obscure and maybe not so obscure programming languages for cutting edge technologies like quantum computing, robotics, VR, self-driving cars, blockchain, and more that you should learn in 2021. And these are languages that are great to learn if you're a beginner or you've been programming for a really long time. You don't even need to buy any specialized hardware to get started with these technologies. So here are my top five programming languages that you should learn in 2021. Number one, Golang. It's described as a mix of C, Java, and Python, but it's especially good for making fast and efficient software. It's a compiled language, so it has a runtime efficiency of C++, but it's pretty easy to read, making it more like an interpreted language like Python. But what really makes Go special? This is implemented in the concept of Go routines, lightweight threads that spin off and can do tasks independently, and channels which can communicate between these threads. Concurrency is about dealing with a lot of things at once, and parallelism is about doing a lot of things at once. Good concurrent design can lead to effective parallelism, and that's what makes Go super performant. But why does speed even matter? We have huge computing resources, right? Well, we're reaching the hardware limitation of Moore's Law, which states that the number of transistors per silicon chip doubles every year. And as the amount of data we need to process increases too, writing performance software becomes more and more important. Research has also found that for every second that it takes for your site to load, revenue is reduced by 7%. So speed is really important. And I know what some of you will say, oh my gosh, Google Cloud is so expensive, I'll never use it, but it's really good for what it's meant for. I worked for two different startups, one used Google Cloud and one used AWS. And one of the biggest differences I saw was between the size of the ops team. So yes, Google Cloud is more expensive, but you're paying for that knowledge and those managed tools. Now to each their own, but we do know that Google Cloud is growing at a really fast pace. In addition to Google, companies that use Go include Netflix, Twitch, Dropbox, and Uber, and Kubernetes and Docker are built on it. If I've convinced you to give Go a try, check out my other videos with top five resources that I use to learn Go. Number two, C Sharp. Now, I don't know why people have such a prejudice against C Sharp. It feels like people are still upset about anything that comes from Microsoft but it can do a lot and inherits a lot of concepts from C and C++ and can build almost anything with it. It's really full purpose. However, one super fun thing that you can do with C Sharp is program games and do virtual reality and augmented reality applications. Gaming is a huge market. Game developers use engines like Unity to build video games. Unity has more than a billion active users and 1.5 million developers. Games are part of our everyday lives now, and I can only see this market expanding. If you want to learn Unity, you should really check out my friend Dilmer's YouTube channel. He makes amazing video tutorials on C Sharp and Unity, creating games, and he actually created a company from these games. So he shares all that startup expertise too. And because C Sharp has been used for so long to make video games, virtual reality and augmented reality applications naturally started integrating with C Sharp. VR and AR is a growing market too. Now, none of us have been outside a lot this year, but does anyone remember the whole big Pokemon Go craze? I mean, we were all outside playing this AR video game and Google started building AR features into things like Google Maps. I think as time goes on, more and more industries will start embracing VR and AR for everyday work and training. I visited VTB Bank once when I was in business for Russia and they showed us they were developing this application to help their employees with public speaking. The VR goggles would show you a crowd and they'd react to how good your speech was. Kind of like Guitar Hero, but I'm not sure if the crowd would actually boo if your speech was bad. Gyms are starting to use VR for exercise, and psychologists and trainers have found that using VR has helped motivate clients to work out and feel better about themselves. And you don't need the super expensive VR goggles like the Oculus Rift or HTC Vibe to start programming VR and AR applications. The simulation engine is enough, and there's also super cheap ways to get started like using Google Cardboard and their SDK. Yeah, that's what it's actually called, and it's only 25 bucks. University of London also has this really cool specialization on Coursera that'll help you get started with virtual reality. Number three, C++. Robots. Need I say more? I actually first started programming in C, so shout out to First Robotics, and my robot once accidentally chased around a guy in a green shirt and started pelting him with balls. This happened because the robot was supposed to aim for a goal and shoot baskets according to the green light, but I accidentally set the parameters for the green a little too wide, so... Sorry about that. My poor, poor robot was now known as the killer robot, but it seems like the last few years C++ has fallen out of favor. I've seen a lot of universities now start teaching Python or Java instead of C++ as the first course. 
However, C++ has always been kind of a popular programming language and is very multi-purpose, but it's really found a cornerstone in robotics. With self-driving cars and Internet of Things, C++ is becoming a language to learn again. What I especially love about robotics is that it gets you closer to the hardware and the software and how they interact. Robots are not just the cute toys you have. Industrial robots manufacture pretty much everything around us. You can start small by using C++ on Arduinos or other Internet of Things devices. And you can get involved with robotics through RoboCup competitions where the robots play soccer, BattleBots where the robots fight each other, or learn to program robots online with C++. Again, you don't necessarily need to buy the robots to actually program them. There's an AWS service called RoboMaker to simulate and deploy robotics applications in the cloud. And there's a simulator called Gazebo. And the same goes for self-driving cars. There's programs you can use to simulate the self-driving cars without having to buy one. There's even a specialization on Coursera on self-driving cars, and Udacity has a nano degree. There's specializations on both platforms for robotics as well, and Udacity even has a nano degree in flying cars. Number four, Python. Good old Python, old reliable. It seems like anything that you want to do with Python, you can just import teleportation or import anti-gravity and Python will just do it for you. And it's a great beginner programming language. It's easy to learn. Maybe it won't always be the best or most efficient solution, but if you want to try and explore a bunch of different applications, you can do that all with Python. There's Python packages for machine learning and deep learning. TensorFlow is huge right now, and it's pretty easy to do deep learning at home. With just a few lines of Python, you can build a classifier and classify cats and dogs using deep learning. There's even Python packages for robotics and even biotechnology and genetics. And there's a lot of packages for quantum computing, which I'll talk about next. Now, even though I work with a bunch of other programming languages now day to day, I always come back to Python. It's super easy to build quick automations and scripts with it and do data analysis using NumPy and Pandas. It will never hurt to learn Python. My favorite resources for learning Python are the Python for Everybody specialization on Coursera by Dr. Chuck, Learn Python the Hard Way book, and free CodeCamp videos on YouTube. Number five, quantum computing libraries. Now this is a bit of a novelty topic, but this channel has a lot of stuff on quantum computing, so I definitely wanted to cover it and include it in this list. There are tons of quantum computing libraries right now and even all new quantum programming languages. Of course, quantum computing is still in the really early stages of technological development. Scientists and researchers are still building these machines and trying to figure out the best applications and what quantum computing can do. A quantum computer won't be faster at any problem, but for a limited set of problems like optimization and simulation problems, Quantum computers can outstrip classical computers really dramatically. But people sometimes get salty on my videos like, oh, that's super cool, but I don't have $15 million for a quantum computer. Must be nice to have one. But you don't need to actually own a quantum computer to do quantum computing programming. You can get access to a quantum computer even for free, even if you're not a scientist or a researcher. Another great thing about quantum computing, I think, is that it helps you build skills that you may not necessarily learn in other applications or using other programming languages. Building software for quantum computers has given me familiarity and exposure to both high-level and low-level programming languages. So we can code a quantum algorithm using a high-level programming language that already has it optimized, but we can also code it in quantum assembly. In my opinion, this helps you become a better programmer because you're getting closer to the hardware. It also makes it easier for you to understand the other lower level languages or how the high level languages get translated into the low level languages. Quantum computing programming might also have you doing some math. So even if quantum computing isn't this big, huge thing yet, all those skills that you're learning are really transferable to other fields. For example, I found it pretty easy to pick up deep learning after learning quantum computing because it's all matrix math. Here are some quantum computing libraries and languages that I recommend you take a look at. There are more, but I wanted to cover the ones that have public access and a lot of documentation that'll help you get started very quickly. There are Python-based frameworks. Qiskit is used on IBM's machines. Circ is Google's language for their quantum chips, and they also have TensorFlow Quantum for quantum machine learning. There's D-Wave Leap, which is for the D-Wave quantum annealer. So it works a little differently, but you have access to real hardware. And there's Penny Lane AI and Strawberry Fields used for quantum machine learning research. Now there are also standalone quantum programming languages. Q-Sharp is Microsoft's standalone programming language for quantum computing. There's also OpenCASM, quantum assembly language. Other languages and frameworks even have connectors to and from quantum assembly language. And there's Silk, a new standalone programming language for quantum computing that's said to be more intuitive. So my recommendation, if you're new to programming and you might want to do quantum computing one day, is to learn Python. Check out this other video that I have on programming language for quantum computers, where I list a ton of resources on where to learn Python. 
Then just pick one of the Python-based libraries above and start learning it. Because quantum programming right now is very circuit-based. So for example, you say to the circuit, you're going to apply a Hadamard gate or a CNOT gate or an X gate or something like that. It's really not going to be that hard for you to switch over to another Python-based framework if you need to. It's kind of like learning keywords in a programming language. So in most languages, there's usually some form of an if statement or a for loop. It's the same for quantum programming. The syntax varies, but the concepts remain the same. Of course, depending on the type of problem that you want to solve, you have to decide if you want to learn a framework for a universal gate-based quantum computer, like IBM's or Google's, or if you want to work on quantum annealers like the D-Wave machines. So pick based on the problem that you want to solve. The nice thing about all these cutting-edge technologies is that because it's so expensive, there's really robust simulation and cloud service frameworks. This makes it super easy to start programming for these applications, even if you don't have money to buy the hardware. So let me know down below which programming language you want to learn for 2021 and which technology you think will really take off this year. And subscribe to this channel and like the video for more quantum tech and coding stuff.